Well, welcome back, everybody, to Two Pastors and a Mic. My name is Shannon. And I'm Corey. And we're so glad that you're joining us wherever you're listening from or watching from. Those of you joining Yo. us on YouTube, thank you so much for being here as well. And as always, like, share, subscribe Do it. to this podcast. Uh, we really appreciate that. Matter of fact, we also appreciate those of you who leave reviews and or comments, whether or not it's on uh, Facebook or Instagram, when you see the post about the podcast episode, or if you're watching YouTube, you can just chime in with a comment. Matter of fact, this past week we Big had, uh, yeah, Jesse actually submitted he's, he's uh, a very right good now. review. Let, let's go ahead and read that. Yeah, Jesse. Hey, we love you. We know you're on your way to work right now as we speak. So hopefully there hasn't been any issues, but he wrote, I love this podcast. When I wake up on Wednesday mornings, I actually look forward to my traffic laden stress making and character testing commute to work. <laughs> Thanks for the encouragement. So shout out to you, Jesse. We yeah. Love you. And if you just need the encouragement to get through the traffic of the day, <laughs> we are glad to be Hump able to day. offer that to you. Uh, but no, for real, we, we, we really do appreciate, um, all of you, those of you who listen, um, and let us know that, uh, and when you reach out to let us know that this podcast is making a difference, Seriously. it's impactful, it's challenging, inspiring. We really love, uh, you know, hearing that and also engaging and it with keeps you growing. In, in conversation. We really appreciate that. I will say, um, that this podcast series that we're getting ready to jump into oh, today, it's spicy. um, you do like, you know, your nickname, right? In the Netherlands is spicy ricey. This you love things spicy. that are controversial. You love things that are spicy. And I will promise you, uh, this whole month will be rather spicy, but we just want to include you, um, in on the journey with us as over the last few months, we've been unpacking some things specifically on the devil, Satan, Lucifer, this concept and ideology and what that really is, what it looks like. Um, and I think it's really, really important that we, we dive in this. Unfortunately. And yeah. Unfortunately. I hate talking about this. Yeah, I do too. And of course I know it's a big pet peeve for you. It is for me too. When churches really focus on Satan or the devil rather than focusing on Jesus. Yeah, because Hebrews says to fix your eyes on Jesus, <laughs> not fix your eyes on the devil who has been defeated, which we're going to talk about for four straight weeks. Right. So so bear with us. Right. So you'll see why we want to have this conversation yeah. this month. And I think you might be shocked at some of our conclusions and some of the suggestions that, we, uh, that we're going to make throughout this month. And I know one of the reasons, the big reason, or three reasons, if you will, why we really want to focus on this. First, we want to provide freedom from fear. You know, when, when you talk about things like a spiritual enemy or Satan, the devil, people get filled with so much fear in their life and it keeps them from living the life that God's called them to live. And when people are full of fear, especially in regard to what they believe to be true, right? Sometimes there's no, uh, there's nothing you can say to them to get them out of that mindset. But what we're going to do is unpack this as slow as we can, as in depth as we can to offer some freedom from any fear that you may be feeling towards some type of enemy. We also want to do this to empower you, to, to let you know that you do have um, power. So stop re-empowering a disempowered enemy. Um, and then thirdly, we want to just bring some, some clarity. And um, one of the things that, that I know to be true is um, in, in our life, what we oftentimes do when things aren't going our way is we will start playing, you know, the blame game. Dun, dun, dun. And so we want to offer some clarity through this so you can be clear on what or who you are blaming because we love to blame other people for things happening negatively in our life. Guilty. And also a lot of us, especially in the church world, we love to blame an enemy. The right? devil. Because it Satan. means we don't have to take responsibility for our own actions. The oh, Satan's man. out to get me. The devil's out to get me. All this stuff. We, we love to focus on the enemy instead of focusing on the power of Jesus in us. Right. And I know you, you talk about this. Um, I learned you, it from dear. Yeah. You've, you've talked about it before though, and it's called spiritual bypassing. And it's where we blame Satan instead of taking responsibility for uh, the evil things that humans do to each other. And so we're going to bring some clarity to that so that you can stop blaming Satan or this spiritual enemy on maybe your bad choices. Oh, man. So it is. Spicy Rice is here <laughs> spicy. for four straight weeks. Now, I do want to pause and say, hold on. What we're going to say from the get-go, you probably might immediately disregard 
or dismiss because it will probably be different from what you have always heard, specifically within the church. And I just want you to be patient with us. Again, we're going to unpack this very in depth because it will bring so much freedom. And I've heard, okay, I will say this. You'll, you'll soon see that the Satan, and I said the in front of it, the Satan is oftentimes, if not every time, religious, demonic, accusational thoughts by any human being at any time. And, and again, we're going to talk about this. We talked a little bit about it in episode 62 on our cow tipping series about debunking this idea that the enemy is out to de- catch you because he's not. He's defeated. And we're going to tell you what we mean by he here in over the next four weeks. Um, but I said something then that I don't know if I believe because I, I listened back to it to make sure that we don't hit too much on the same episode. Yeah. And I said then, and this was over a year ago, that I believed in a spiritual entity. But I'm not so sure I'm there now, today. So don't call me a heretic yet. Let me explain my journey of getting to this conclusion because we unpacked several things in that episode and we'll hit on some of those again. But in order to be able to share the next couple episodes over the next couple weeks, we have to share this historical context. Now, whatever you believe about the Satan, whether you believe it to be an entity or not, and I'm going to try to convince you that it's not an entity. Uh, Jesus, however, 2,000 years ago, render that ideology powerless. So when you even said in the intro, stop re-empowering a disempowered devil or disempowered enemy, we're not even talking about a spiritual entity. But if you are, that spiritual entity was disempowered 2,000 years ago. But we're going to show you how, at least scripturally, it's not talking about a spiritual entity. Hebrews 2.14 says, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil. And again, we're going to explain why. This isn't a spiritual entity. It's any one of us at any time living from a spirit of Antichrist. We're going to get to that as well today. So we are going to suggest to you today that the Satan, the devil, or any other name used in the Bible is not necessarily talking about a spiritual entity. And it's going to take us several weeks to unpack this. So please don't don't just dismiss this. Be open. We know that this is spicy. We, may, we know that you are probably going to have a lot of questions. I promise you over the next four weeks, we will probably answer them over the course. Yeah. So be patient with be us patient. over the month. And today, what we really want to do is just kind of unpack, this is kind of going to be broad, but just kind of like four things that we want to talk about specifically with the Satan or the devil or some type of spiritual enemy. So first off, we need to talk about Lucifer. It's very interesting what we found out. So Lucifer is actually not found in the Hebrew or Greek text. At all. At all. There's actually a mistranslation of it though that's used in Isaiah chapter 14 verse 12. Now this is thanks to Jerome in 200 AD when he translate morning star as Luce- uh, Luciferus however which is how you say it which is derived from Canaanite myth- mythology. Now Lucifer is only in old English translations of the Bible think like the original KGV. Now in all newer translations it's actually translated you can look it up morning star or shining one, not Lucifer, right? And not to mention, check this out, this idea of morning star is used to describe Jesus in Revelation twenty two sixteen. Shocking for you probably. Yeah, so shocking. Now, I will say that the scholars kind of debate who this is referenced to in Isaiah, this morning star. Some say it might be Adam. Some say it's Nebuchadnezzar. Some say it's Belshazzar, but not only is it describing humanity, it's a metaphor for describing mindsets that use evil to gain power. So again, this idea of Lucifer is not some, like you said earlier, some spiritual entity. Yeah. Here it's describing not only humanity, but mindsets to use evil to gain power. Now, just a, a, a quick history lesson here. Much of Christianity began to teach that the devil and Lucifer were one and the same only because of fictional books such as Dante's Inferno that was written in the year 1321. Again, our English translation, the KGV was translated, what's like 1611. And then after that, it continued on this dualistic thinking of, or not dualistic, parallel thinking of the devil being Lucifer, one and the same in Milton's Paradise Lost written in 1667 because they both referred to the devil in these plays or writings as Lucifer. Right. 
which is wild. So your TV show Lucifer even is influenced by Dante's Inferno, not the Bible. Not the Bible. Actually, so. You said my show. You, you know I watched that show? No. Did I say my show? You your said show? my show. Your show? <laughs> I meant like I have your watched show the whole in, series. In I general. thought it was. I've never watched it. It was cleverly written. Yeah. Really stupid, but uh, we did finish it. What? Whatever. It, 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 it's funny. All right. Number two. <laughs> so secondly, um, let's kind of unpack the words here, the Greek and the Hebrew word. So diablos is what we find in most of the New Testament. This is the Greek word for devil. And hasatan, right, is Hebrew for Satan. And these translations, they're not an entity, right? They are not nouns. They are both action verbs, and they describe things such as, right, condemnation, things that hinder, things that accuse, things that come against a person, right? Satan um, and legion, we see that as well when in Jesus's reference, Satan and legion are not names, it's a function. So think about it like this, the Greek word specifically diablos, it means slanderer, which is anyone that slanders. So if I slander you right now, I'm operating as in the, the devil. spirit of the devil. the devil. Right. And Paul uses this term to describe people who spread gossip in the local church. Oh my gosh. They're so acting as devils. Wait, so you mean to tell me there are more devils in the church than out? <laughs> oh now, dear. Now let's go to the Hebrew word, hasatan. It also means very specifically adversary or again, accuser. So anyone that is in accusation, they are operating as the Satan or in the spirit of Satan. Now this word in the Hebrew Bible, it occurs nine different times. Five of those times, it's used to describe a human military, political, or legal opponent. Opponent. Four times, though, it is in reference to some divine being. However, this reference to a divine being is more of a job description than a proper name for the Satan. So think of it like ego. And I know you're going to talk about that in our third point. So I'm not going to dive in there. And we're going to take a whole episode next week to talk about that as well. Right. And so it's actually never used in the Hebrew Bible as a proper name. That's what I wanted to get across. And it only appears once out of all nine times without the. So eight out of the nine, it's the Satan. One time it just says Satan. And this is when Satan came against, rose up against David and incited him to take a census. Right. And so, again, we're going to talk Which about not whether spiritual entity. that was ego or, yep. yes, yep. this this uh, spiritual entity. So there is no devil concept in ancient Israel's worldview. Um, I came across this quote, John Drummond, who is with the Biblical Archaeology Society. He says this in the Hebrew Bible, God's greatest enemies are not fallen angels commanding arm armies of demons, nor even the gods of other nations, but rather human beings. It isn't the devil that spreads evil across the face of creation. It's mankind. It's crazy to think about. And he continues that thought. Yeah. And he then says, by the first century, Judaism developed a belief in the divine forces of darkness doing battle against the forces of light. And this can be seen within the New Testament and the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are right extra biblical writings. You, you see this take place now. Let's unpack here, though, the Greek word for a minute to tie this to tie it in back to the Hebrew word. So the Greek word for devil, again, diablos, it means slanderer. And it comes from a verb that means to hurl accusation, just like Satan is right. The accuser in the Septuagint, the Greek devil and the Hebrew Satan are equivalent. New Testament references to Satan reflect a struggle with or for spiritual freedom which this happens where? Where does the struggle for spiritual freedom happen in our lives today? In our minds. In the mind. Colossians 1, 21 and 22 says that we were separated from God and we were enemies of God where? In, in our mind. mind. Interesting. Interesting, yes. And I know uh, I'm gonna say this as a preface before I jump into what I'm about to jump into, but I've heard from several people, even people that I used to look up to, that when you remove this entity idea from the devil or Satan, that's when you're operating like a devil or Satan. So beware of people who don't believe in Satan. Those are the people that are under the Antichrist already or under spiritual warfare. My friends, God didn't die to give you a spiritual battle. He died and he gave you a spiritual victory. So again, what we're going to unpack is very important for you to understand because the third reason is, you, you said this earlier, is that the, the devil 
There's no devil concept in ancient Israel's worldview. I actually first heard this say like six years ago. First heard this said six years ago from Jamie. He said that idea, and I was like, I don't believe that. There's no way. I'm not just going to believe everything I hear, especially things like this. Yeah. And, and you can study this. So I went and studied this out because that is a fascinating statement without a reference. So I, I did some <laughs> reference work for you so you can know that I'm not just believing this. Every Hebrew thought believed that Satan, not again, not to be an evil entity, but rather humanity's evil inclination or ego. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about ego, but next week's episode, I'm going to break down yeah. ego work from a scientific basis, and it's fascinating. Again, we'll talk about this greater next week. My sources for this, because again, I had to go research this, the, the JPS Guide to Jewish Traditions, huge textbook, uh, the New Standard Jewish Encyclopedia, the Jewish Book of Why, and the second version of the Jewish Book of Why, uh, just to name a few resources that you can actually go and fact check us on that this was their original uh, Second Temple, second temple Judy, uh, Judaism Isn't, thought mm -hmm. and ancient Near History, uh, or ancient Near, near Culture, Eastern, yeah. Near East, yeah, all that stuff. They actually called this idea Yester Hara, which is interesting. Ancient Hebrew thought, the modern Christian thought, or ancient Hebrew thought and the modern Christian thought around Satan are very different. So that should make you think as a modern day Christian, if, if what you believe about the scriptures did not mean what it meant to the original audience, somebody's wrong, right? J just saying that. Christians today tend to believe in a spiritual entity. And this spiritual entity is invisible, it opposes God, and it runs around causing havoc, yet we don't know exactly where it is. This should should, should cause you to question, right? Like, we re-empower this idea, but he's not omnipresent like God is. Right. So who gets to dictate where and what this, you know what I'm saying? It, it just doesn't make sense when you actually think about it. Yeah. And not to mention, especially when people say the devil's out to get me. Wait, there are eight billion people right. on the planet today, and you think you're that important that the devil is after you specifically because you overslept and you lost your job? Yeah, that's when we emphasize Sorry, I just, an, an that out there. entity. <laughs> but it's important for us to question these things because I think that where we're coming from takes less, spe like jumping through theological hoops than to believe that one. I have a problem if God created a spiritual entity to oppose Him. And then people will say, well, no, he's a fallen angel. I have a greater theological issue with sin being in heaven from a fallen angel, which, by the way, is not anywhere in Scripture. It, it's a third of the angels is mentioned only one time in Revelation 12, and that's talking about a real event in the world. It's not talking about what happened in heaven, for the record. That idea of a third of the angels is actually in the book of Maccabees, which is rejected in Christian uh what, what's it called in in the canonized yeah. Christian yeah. scriptures? It's not canon. It's not a canonized. It's part book. of the apocrypha. So they rejected that idea. So where did you get this idea that a third right. of the angels? Because it, it's made also, up. Because what, also, what, what's interesting, and I learned this from you. What's interesting in this book of Maccabees, Jesus actually was married. Yeah. So There's if you so ask, much. if you ask a church follower or a Christ follower that's a part of the church today, hey, do you believe that Jesus was ever married in his life? They'd be absolutely not. Well, do you believe that you know a third of the angels fell from heaven? Yes, I would. Well. You have to believe both in the same because they're both found in the same book, yeah. the book of Maccabees. Well, people don't so you have to believe that also Jesus was married if you believe a third of the angels fell from heaven. There's people going, what, what is the book of Maccabees? I've never even heard that. Yeah, I know. We, we know there's a lot of modern day Christians haven't Three learned a lot about that stuff. And that's not a shot. I'm still learning a lot about this stuff. But again, Christians today tend to believe in this spiritual entity where Hebrews in the first century believed in less of an, of an evil entity and more of an expression of opposition within humanity specifically in your mind, and then as you act out. Uh, for example, in Numbers 22, 22, the story of Balaam and the talking donkey, it says, says that the angel of the Lord stood in the road to oppose him. But the Hebrew says that the angel of the Lord stood as Satan. So now you have to, okay, wait, what? Because did God send this or not? Again, you have to understand and read the Bible through the lens of Jesus to understand that there are certain scriptures that you should reject if God says to do something and then people murdered people in the name of God, and that obviously doesn't look like Jesus. And so in the Jewish mind, whatever stood in your way was the Satan, which is, again, typically your own ego. Speaking of Hebrew thought, the serpent in the book of Genesis is not a snake, historically. I mean, we, we, we added that into the story because we believe that because serpents are snakes in, in stories, but not in this specific story. There is even great debate around the whole story, but I think that this can bring some clarity. According to Jeff Brenner, who's an ancient Hebrew researcher, he claims that evil in the Hebrew is actually the word ra, R-A, and is actually closer translated to mean dysfunctional or operating in the wrong mentality. This is 
very significant. I've actually changed how I've taught. Instead from, of something being an evil, something's in dysfunction. dysfunction which goes back to the counseling world and, and all that stuff anyways. Um, the, and good is better translated as functional. So it's not the, you know, about good versus evil. It's about functional versus dysfunctional. And when you are living in sin, yeah, that's dysfunction. When you don't know who you are, that's dysfunction. Mm. All of this, when you know who God is and that he is a good father, it's because he's a functional father giving you function on earth. It's, it's actually fascinating when you, when you understand these. When these definitions are understood along with what ancient Hebrews believed around ego, it's fair to conclude that Eve was deceived in her mind. I know that might be controversial for you to understand. The problem with good and evil is more of a problem between function and dysfunction. Function is bringing order to chaos with love, grace, and restoration, while dysfunction is fear-based and insecurity-driven. God is very patient, knowing that most people are not malicious as much as mistaken, not deceitful as much as deceived. Remember, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing, or in other words, ignorant, they, they don't know what they're doing. They're being ignorant right now. Not forgive them for they are evil. Pause. Hmm. Evil or dysfunction is using the law to measure ourselves to feel strong, superior, faithful, and more moral than others, while good or function is using grace to live a life of compassion, mercy, forgiveness, and love. Dysfunction is using disciplined behavior to feel holy and righteous. This is true evil, often disguised as good. Function is using God's faith to accept the gifts of holiness and righteousness because of the disciplined behavior and the work of Jesus. Again, we're, we're trying to make you make uh, look at Jesus to make him bigger in your life and understand. To further understand the reality of ego and the corporate ego, which is often personified in the scriptures as the devil or Satan. The devil or Satan is not some gargoyle sitting on top of a building looking for a victim or a dark spirit lurking in the shadows. It's simply the personification of everything that's not of God. In other words, how we think, specifically according to the Old Covenant law. As Ephesians 4, 5 tells us, there is only one spirit, and that is the Holy Spirit. Okay, there's only one spirit, and that is the Holy Spirit. There's not two spirits. The Holy Spirit and this devil, whatever. Okay, I'll, I'll just let you <laughs> unpack that. With all of this knowledge, who are the accusers and slanders of the Gentile churches? Well, it's the law followers, which Jesus confronts. Yeah. There's your which Pharisees, we're unpack later on high depth. priests. We'll come back to this part three and part four. We're going to blow your mind yep. with unpacking who Jesus was even talking about when he says even the words devil and Satan, which is crazy. Karl Barth says it this way. Whenever the devil is mentioned in scripture, in scripture, it's only to be dismissed because evil is a distraction. It's the absence of goodness. It's a lack of life, empathy, and love. In other words, it's, dis it's dysfunction. Okay. Again, we, I will unpack ego in a very scientific way next week. It's going to be good. Fourth, and these are just, we're just going to go through some of these trigger words real quick because we touched on Lucifer, devil, and Satan. Well, what about the mark of the beast? And what about the number of the beast? And what about, you know, other wolf and sheep clothes and other stuff like that and all this stuff? The mark of the beast and the number of the beast is found only in the book of Revelation, Revelation 13. Verses 16 is the mark of the beast. In, that was for in order for people to trade. You had to take the mark of Caesar. Again, person the number of the beast in revelation 16 13 you have to understand like greek code and ap uh, apostolic what no apocalyptic code that they wrote in numbers to describe people so here's wisdom let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast for it is the number of a man his number is 666 which in some hebrews it's even 616 but if if you understand that they used codes like numbers to describe certain people that the number or the name he, uh, Nero, Nero, which was the Roman Empire at the time, equals 666. And that's not some like conspiracy theory. That's like Greek philosophers and teachers of that stuff all agree that who the mark of the beast and who the beast is, is the Roman Empire, specifically Nero, specifically in the book of Revelation. It's not some Satan entity figure that, that you're thinking of. Some manuscripts have the number of the beast as 616 instead of Hebrews 66, uh, 666. You can find this stated in almost any study Bible, actually. Uh, what is shocking is in the Hebrew, it is 666. There's a very strong evidence that Caesar Nero really was the one being referred to as the beast and that the change from 666 to 616 in some manuscripts was intentionally done for that very reason. It is nearly impossible to find another person's name in that time frame that would fit this scenario. Caesar Nero's name in Hebrew, Gamesha, I don't even know how to say that word, adds up to 666 since this was written about soon events. No other person can be found within this time scope with who this name fits the requirements and description, especially none that can be found in the future of 96 AD. Lastly, 
the beast was a metaphor for the Roman Empire and King Nero. As Jonathan Foster says, it was John's way of using metaphor to describe the toxic air that's being emitted by the collusion of military, nationalistic, religious, economic, and political engines. The bad news, we've all been marked by this beast because we've all been living in an empire. The good news, the mark of the lamb is greater. So awesome. And then last but not least, we will talk about the wolf in sheep clothes next week because I did a whole unpacking of it. But the Antichrist. Ooh, what do you mean about the Antichrist? Well, first of all, the Antichrist is not in the book of Revelation at all. Uh, the, anti, the spirit of Antichrist, let me be clear, isn't even in the Bible. It's the spirit of Antichrist. It doesn't say Antichrist. The spirit of Antichrist. The spirit of Antichrist is mentioned four times in the entire Bible, three times in 1 John and once in 2 John. It is in reference to a false teaching in the first century that claimed that Jesus did not even come in the flesh, which was the agnostics' beliefs. 1 John 2, 2, uh, 1 John 2 22 says, Who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist denying the Father and the Son. So the spirit of the Antichrist is not a specific person or an entity but rather a belief system that any person at any given time can have. You and I can operate in the spirit of Antichrist, specifically when we're not loving or we're slandering and accusing, all that stuff that Satan and Lucifer and the devil, all that stuff, that it does. It's great. It's the spirit of wanting to do life on your own, or in other words, being Antichrist. Anyone living in the spirit of Antichrist and anti-love. This happens when we're accusing. A great example is Martin Luther claimed that the Pope was the Antichrist, which was the first I don't know. I, I was shocked to find this out. The first reference, reference of someone claiming someone to be the Antichrist was Martin Luther when he claimed the Pope to be the Antichrist, hmm. which is crazy because Pope Leo at the time, who was uh, Pope Leo X, he returned the favor and claimed that Luther was the Antichrist. So they both hmm. acted like the Antichrist when they accused each other of, the anti of being the Antichrist. Wow. And since this, Protestants and Catholics have been using the Bible as a weapon in this regards ever since. Isn't that crazy? So crazy. When you think about that, like opposition of Protestants and Catholics and tracing it back to that, you know, Mind blowing. That, that was new for me too. So we've already unpacked a lot and we have a lot more to go the rest of the month, Stay but, with us. but let me just close out today's episode with this thought. I think it's great. It's from theologian, Michael Harden. He actually says this, the Satan is alive and well in America, a so-called Judeo Christian nation. The Satan is the extended finger of blame. We see this from every type of person, every movement, everywhere. There is virtually no one exempt. It occurs in the family. It happens between nations. Make a mistake and you're no good. You're out. Commit a sin and you're out. Say something someone doesn't like and you're out. Disagree with someone's interpretation and you're out. Banished, marginalized, ignored, hated, vilified, especially in the one place that one would have thought the Satan had been exercised, Christendom. Yep. So don't call us Satans for saying that the Satan entity doesn't necessarily exist. Remember, the Satan and the devil is anytime you're in a spirit of accusation without restoration. Yep. Yes, you can disagree with some of the conclusions that we might have, but we're trying to empower you to walk in the spirit of Christ which is the only spirit that exists. The, the opposite spirit of Christ is when we start to do things on our own, under ego, under law living, under religious grasp, which religion literally means bondage or chains. So when you live in religion, it's because you're not living in freedom with Christ and you're just gonna produce bondage and slavery. Right, right. remember what we're doing this for is one, to bring clarity around this subject. Number two, to empower you, to bring empowerment into your life. And three, to bring freedom because that's what we want you to be operating in. So we really encourage you to stay with us all month. Next week, we're going to be unpacking, as you said, ego work. I know it's one of the things that you love to talk about. We're also going to talk about the law and its influence as the Satan in a lot of people's life, because the law is very accusational. And if Satan means accu accuser, and if the devil is operating the spirit of accusation, maybe that could be also operating in the dun, law dun, dun. and law-based living. Um, the two places right in the law are accusation and slander. So we'll, we'll, we'll touch on some of that next week. Um, but we really encourage you to um, reach out to us. Um, if you have certain questions, maybe uh, we know we're going to hit them or maybe we're not going to talk about them this month. Maybe we can incorporate it if there's something um, that you're maybe having questions about or considering, but uh, reach out to us. Let us know. Also, if this podcast is uh, encouraging you in your walk, if you do find it bringing freedom and clarity, 
um, share it with a friend, have conversation over it. That's why we do what we do. Um, but above all else, just know um, as you listen, as you follow along in this journey with us, hopefully above everything else, you know that you are loved and there's nothing you can do about it.